morning. Good morning. Uh, you can come see for a second. We have a, a couple of announcements. First, I want to say if uh, you're visiting with us, we're happy that you're here. Uh, and I uh, want to say Happy New Year. You can do better than that. Happy New Year! That, sounds, that was the saddest Happy New Year I've ever had. Uh, Wes is out uh, this uh, this morning, this week, uh, weekend. Uh, he and uh, Jessica are celebrating their 12th anniversary. And so if you see them, wish them a happy anniversary. Uh, we've, we'd love for you to sign in using the welcome card down in the pews. And if you're on, online, welcome. Uh, you can sign in and, and so we can know who is uh, watching by uh, going to wimberleyumc.org backslash connect. For those here, you can place the cards in the offering plate. We also have uh, prayer request cards. So if you have a prayer request, uh, you can place them in the offering plate as well. Next week begins our stewardship series, an extremely important subject. And it's about more than just giving financially. It's, it's about a way of living and, and loving. And uh, speaking of living and loving, uh, we have an uh, announcement by uh, the one I live with. And I'm saying her. And I love her, too. Uh, also, uh, Jordan, I think Jordan has an announcement. Good morning and happy new, year. happy new Year. So in just a second after our opening prayer, our kids are going to be invited to go in the back with Mr. John to go across to the Fellowship Hall for Kids Church. This morning, they will be watching a special showing of the Wise Men's story. So in just a second, after our opening prayer, all kids, you're invited to go with Mr. John to Kids Church. Yeah, I go. <laughs> See you. Um, also, uh, we have uh, an announcement about the communion offering this morning. And it will benefit uh, the Crisis Bread, Racks, Bread Basket. Uh, the mission team here and, and the church has been working with the local churches and, and uh, to deliver food to children in, in, uh, in need uh, when school is not in session. Not only during the summertime, but during this Christmas break. And so if you would like to support that effort, uh, the, uh, um, you have an opportunity at the grocery store. Any other announcements? Your name, sir? Oh, my name is John. <laughs> my name is John Warren, and I am a uh, part of the church here. I'm a retired United Methodist minister and probably forgot who I was, so. <laughs> I, I will say this is a wonderful, welcoming church, and we're glad to be here. Um, let's bow our hands in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come at the beginning of a new year, a new start, uh, with new hope, with a future ahead. And so we begin by gathering together with our brothers and sisters to share in this day, to give you thanks, and to remember the grace that you share with us through Holy Communion. Be with us in our worship, that we might give you glory, and carry the light that you have bestowed upon us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. You stand and join us as we sing Angels We Have Heard on the Mind. Angels We Have Heard. 
Here I am to worship, here 
God, use us that the world may know of a love greater than we can ever imagine. Multiply the gifts that you give through us, that that love may be multiplied in the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, the only Son of our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born in the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended to the right hand of the Father, the Father Almighty. There will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of body, and the life everlasting.
it's so good to have Billy Roy back with us. We enjoy enjoy the gifts that you give and praise to God. Let us bow. Our Heavenly Father, use me as your spirit calls. Open our ears and our hearts to hear the words that you may have us speak. Fill us with your love, your sustenance, and prayer. If you ever feel like life is a whirlwind, well, take a deep breath. Go ahead. You have survived the holiday hurricane season. The days where we fill our calendars with the things that we have to do, that we think we have to do in order to celebrate the birth of Christ. The time of Advent to prepare our hearts has, has taken backstage to preparing our homes or propping up our emotions as we get ready to gather the family together for Christmas because we all have those relatives that we don't quite agree with. It is a rare family that doesn't face some sort of struggle during this season. I grew up in a family of five. Uh, Mom, Dad, Elaine, that's my sister sitting next to Sandra. Eddie came six years later, uh, my older brother, our older brother, our brother. And then five years later, I was the surprise. Surprise! <laughs> but Eddie was our parents' favorite. If you don't believe me, ask Elaine. <laughs> parents, do your children a favor? Don't have favorites. He loved to play baseball from a very early age. He, he played fast pitch softball into his 40s. Uh, he actually, his team actually won the Bass Pitch Softball uh, World Series twice. He wore the jacket all the time. Uh, he is honored in the Bass Pitch Softball Hall of Fame. Yes, there is one. It's in a restaurant in Houston. Um, <laughs> if you wanted to see him, you would have to go to a game. Really? It's the only time we would see him. My parents followed him everywhere. Uh, his team uh, play, uh, acted as my dad's pallbearers. For years, I wanted to be like him. After dad passed a number of years, mom began to show signs, serious signs of dementia. It was during that time that my brother talked mom into making him the financial officer. Within six months, mom called me upset and asked me to check on her finances, that something was wrong, that Eddie was telling her that she shouldn't send, spend money. Uh, when I checked, I found that Eddie was spending large amounts of her funds. And when I talked to him, he said it would be his anyway. We lived the prodigal son's story. Elaine and I were the sons who stayed home and, and tried to make responsible decisions for, for mom. Uh, our brother was the one who couldn't wait and he wanted to claim what was his at that time. When the doctor said that mom should not live at home, Eddie told her that she could do what she wanted. When she did go to the nursing home, mom wouldn't talk to him. Lane and I, because he told her that we were the ones who put her there. Getting her affairs in order was tough. We had to go, uh, we had to hire someone to lead us through this mess. Mom passed on October 26, 2007. That year, Eddie didn't come for Christmas. I don't think we called him. I did. As time passed, 
uh, we began to know, recognize that something was wrong with our brother. As it turns out, he had early onset Alzheimer's. His wife would call me and say, "Will you talk to your brother? He's looking for you." And I would talk to him because he had, he had reverted to our childhood, and I would talk to him about things we did in our childhood. And then uh, to give her a break, we would go and get him, or she would bring him to us, and he would stay with us for a weekend. The last fall was the, uh, the fall of 2011, and he followed me around everywhere. And so I remember that as uh, boys, we would go to the refrigerator and, and get pickle jar, the pickle jar, and drink the pickle juice out of the pickle jar. Anybody do that? Yeah. And so I, he followed me to the kitchen and I said, do you want, a, do you want a, uh, some pickle juice? He looked at me puzzled, like, I don't know what you're talking about. So I pulled out the pickle jar, opened it up, and I said, you want to taste? And he nodded his head, he tasted he, he put it to his lips and then his eyes went. <laughs> and I said, did you like that? A grin came across his face and he nodded his head. Do you want, want to do it again? He said, yes. And, and again, and he put it to his lips and his eyes flew open. He'd already forgotten the, the, the shock of the taste. He passed on December 20th, 2011, 10 years ago. His wife Mona asked me to officiate at his service. In the whirlwind of life, we can get thrown around a lot. My friend Stephen Kerr, who was a disc jockey in Austin, uh, lost his son to suicide in December of this year. On New Year's Eve, he would have been 29. Lives get tossed around. Tuesday, my friend will testify against the drunk driver who struck his car head on, killing his son, and then striking his wife's car, killing her. And for the last three years, he and his sister in law have been in and out of hospitals, um, facing surgery after surgery. Or it could be an electrical wire causing a fire in Boulder, Colorado, or, or a political or medical disagreement, or, or simply a word or an action taken the wrong way that tangles a relationship and causes sparks to fly. You see, we live in turbulent times, but we can't calm the waters. Whatever it is that divides isn't as strong as the love that sustains us. I used a popular song of the time by John Mayer. By the way, Billy, uh, Sandra says uh, that you're, you're our John Mayer. <laughs> For the funeral message, I used the song, Say. Do you know the song? The lyric says, say what you need to say. It says it over and over. Say what you need to say. Say what you need to say. Say what you need to say. Sometimes we have to hammer that in. Say what you need to say. Some of the most joyous days and saddest comes with, come with the ones we deeply love. Say what you need to say. Build love and respect. It, it's not an easy discussion at times, but it is worth it. Jeremiah had a tough job. It was a cold and windy period in the history of God's people. Uh, there were enemies without and enemies within and disagreements. And as is often the case when prophets were called to, to, to speak, the, the people had forgotten who they were and whose they were. And they had released their grip on the vision that had brought them through the, this, the wilderness. 
They had settled back from the hard work of living in the community that, that had given them their identity, and they had abandoned the law that was handed them to, to live by. The law and, and, and replaced it with the law of convenience, the law of every man for himself, the law of profit, the law of, of power and get even, the law that felt good when, when feelings were wrong. So Jeremiah was charged with, as my nephew says, poking the bear. Do not poke the bear. He was charged with correcting them when, when they didn't feel like they were doing anything wrong or not doing anything that anybody else wasn't doing. He had to point out that their flaw logic, their, their self-centered motives, he had to point out and remind them of their failings as members of a covenant community. Worse than that, he had to point out the consequences. You keep doing that, he would say. Then here's what's going to happen. Brought at the center of their thinking uh, would, would take them over and, and eating away at them until there was nothing but shells, empty and hurting, and not understanding why. They would turn on one another, eating away at whatever dignity they had uh, and whatever they could cling to. So to say Jeremiah was hated, it, it was putting it mildly. Jeremiah was, was tossed in prison. He, he was thrown in pits. He was ignored by most and jeered at, uh, jeered at by others. I wonder what he would say today. And I can tell you the reaction to it would probably be about the same. Jeremiah would be poking the bear in a world full of, of people bent on their own beliefs, their own way. But you know what? You can find a hopeful, joy-filled message from Jeremiah as well, if you know where to look. We're in the little book of Consolation, chapters 30 through 33 in Jeremiah. They take on a completely different tone than the rest of the book. It's as if God knew that Jeremiah was wearing out and needed a break. Being a bearer of bad news is exhausting. The people needed to hear something else. You know what it's like to want to hear something else. We long to hear good news because we Hear so much of the bad. Our reading comes from the little book of Consolation, and it sounds just the right tone for us to hear the words of God. Now in Jeremiah 31, 7 through 14. For thus says the Lord, sing aloud with gladness for Jacob, and raise shouts for the chief of nations. Proclaim, give praise, and sing, and say, Save, O Lord, your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I'm, do, I'm going to bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, those whose child, those with child and those in labor, together a great company. They shall re return here. With weeping they shall come, and with consolations I will lead them back. I will let them, I will let them walk by the brooks of water in a straight path, in which they shall not stop. For I have become a father to Israel, and Ephraim is, Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away. Say, he who scattered Israel will gather him, 
and will keep him as a shepherd and a flock. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob and has ransomed him from hands too strong for him. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion, and they shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain, the wine, and the oil, and over the young of the flock and the herd. Their lives shall become like a watered garden, and they shall never languish again. Then shall the young women rejoice in the dance, and the young men and the old shall be merry. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. I will give the priests their fill of fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my bounty, says the Lord. This is the word of God. I will give them gladness for sorrow. Gladness isn't just relief. It, gladness is about joy abounding. In, in, in the Bible, the word gladness is usually used to talk about uh, talk about weddings. And, and the people in the Bible, the uh, people of Israel, had, uh, knew how to throw a wedding party. Gladness appears seven times in the book of Jeremiah, and, and four of them are about the end of gladness. It is taken away. It is ended. It is no more because of the hard-handedness of the people. But three times, all of them in that little book of consolation, is a promise and a hope. The sweetest joy comes in the midst of sorrow. The deep, deepest laughter comes bordered by tears. Or the most healing laughter, the most transforming joy, comes in the midst of struggle and brokenness. It's about trusting as we make our way through our lives. It's, a, it's with the lightness of heart that allows us to find joy in our lives. I will give them gladness for sorrow. It's a promise. It's a promise we can live. that promise holds true for today. As we gathered here on Christmas Eve, uh, and, and we took the light from the Christ candle, and we brought that light to you, and we sang joy to the world, and we carried that light into the world, Jesus gave, a, gave us a promise that whenever we come here and we break bread, that we receive more power and strength by His grace. That when our candles begin to flicker, we can come here and be given more strength to share that love even farther. So let's prepare our hearts. Today you were given these little wonderful cups that sometimes are a challenge. So you might want to get the first part going by pulling back the, the cellophane. Many years ago, Jesus gathered his disciples together knowing that he would be leaving Together the closest with them. Even the one that would betray him was included in the feast. So don't let your thinking uh, cause you to think that, that you should not take part. His love is stronger than anything else in the world. He said, Whenever you break this bread and eat it, I want you to think of my body. That is my body that is broken for you. That you may have my love and my strength. So will you join with me 
and take your breath. And if you went high, then I will we'll slow down. So we take the bread and we eat it. When the meal was over, he took the cup. He said, whenever you share this cup, remember, remember me. And know that this is my blood that was shed for you. Because of my love for you is so great that my Father gave me up for you. So we joined together and drank this one. Our Heavenly Father, as we share in this wonderful act of, of communion, there's nothing so uh, so personal as the act of eating and tasting. And as sure as we taste the bread that tastes like chalk and the wine that tastes like juice, we know that by this act, you do something greater. You give us strength and light to rekindle that light that you gave to us, that we might go into a world that is still in turmoil, which has always been in turmoil since your birth. And through that, you give us a way to face the whirlwind that is blowing, even today, a cold 23. So thank you for giving us this handle to grab onto. In your son's name, we pray. Amen. Would you stand and join us as we sing our closing hymn, Go Tell It On The Mountain.
It's titled, How the Work of Christmas Begins. It's by Howard Thurman. How the work of Christmas begins when the song about the angels is still, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with the flocks, then the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal those broken in spirit, to feed the hungry, to release the oppressed, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among all peoples, to make a little music with the heart, and to radiate the life of Christ every day, in every way, in all that we do, and all that we say. Then the work of Christmas begins. Go out and do the work of Christmas, in all that you do, and all that you say, and let a little song of the heart go with you along the way. Blessings. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year.